All right, everybody, I want to welcome you back from spring break and say thank you for attending our return of the Webster Data Lecture Series. Uh, today, we have a wonderful design speaker who I am not going in to introduce, and it is because uh, as you guys know from our previous uh, speaker, uh, Javen, um, we are actually inviting some of our D Webster Design alums to introduce and invite uh, speakers for the lecture series this semester. And so today I want to welcome not only our speaker, but also the person who suggested that they come talk to us today, uh, Daniel Frumhoff. He was a Webster graduate in 2015 and is a design director, design educator, and motion designer at Daniel Frumhoff Design. Daniel, you want to take it away? Yeah, sure. Thank you so much, Emily. Um, great to see all everyone popping in and all, all the names. Um, yeah, I'm uh, happy to be here. I uh, nominated Holly for this, um, this speaker series for uh, today and want to speak a little bit to that and then I can totally introduce her before she jumps right in. Um, so initially we were talking with Nariko a little bit about um, who might come in and speak. And I, I thought Holly would be great. Um, she's a longtime friend and mentor and someone that I worked closely with at Claire's um, right after I graduated from uh, college. And yeah, some, some questions that, you know, even as a, a design student Webster, I was always um, wondering was how do, how do you measure successful graphic design in the real world? Um, how are these kind of global campaigns for huge brands launched and concepted and, and how do they have real impact? And how do brands use uh, design to tell authentic stories? As well as how do brands take an active role in you know, designing for good social responsibility and empathy? Um, we had design for good as a class at Webster. And so I thought it would be really appropriate for Holly to, to come in and kind of speak about all the, the other, the whole other side of the, the industry, the business, um, and yeah, shed some light on that. I definitely encourage everyone along the way to like add questions in the comments and Holly can speak to that too. And without further ado, I'll introduce Holly. Um, Holly is the vice president of global marketing at Claris and has over 20 years of experience with global marketing and media communications. She's worked across many, many sectors, including CPG, service, travel, e-commerce, fashion, luxury, and entertainment. Um, at Claire's, she leads marketing efforts for the brand portfolio, including brands like Naturalizer, Alan Edmonds, Dr. Schulz, Frank Osardo, and many, many more. Uh, just to name a few from her past of amazing brands that she's worked with. Um, it includes Enterprise Rent-A-Car, Budweiser, Bud Light, National Car Rental, Alamo Car Rental, and uh, Sony PlayStation. And so without further ado, Oh, one more thing. I want to give a shout out to Sina who designed the social graphics to promote this event and Ashley V for help on presentation design. And yeah, I'll hand it over to Holly to take it away. All right. Thank you, Daniel, for the kind introduction. Um, and thanks everybody who's dialed in on Zoom. I'm based here in St. Louis, so I wish circumstances were different and we could have done this live. That would have been fun. But um, we'll, just, we'll just go virtual like we've been doing for the better part of a year. And I did want to throw out that, you know, questions are welcome. Love for you either to vocalize them or put them in the chat to make it a more, you know, interesting conversation and make sure you're getting out of it what you seek to learn. Um, and then we will randomly, randomly, I'll work with Emily to select a couple of um, folks who participate by asking questions. Um, and we'll give you some free shoes. So it'll be super fun. So think of those questions and uh, get them in the chat. All right, let me just make sure this all works. Here we go. All right, so that's who I am. I just thought it would be fun quickly to talk about um, my career journey. I think, you know, I always found that super interesting to understand when I was in college and like looking out what I might want to do, uh, who, you know, how people ended up where they end up, um, what are the different paths they take. So I went to journalism school at the University of Missouri. And when I graduated from there, I joined Fleischmann Hillard um, as a PR intern and then, you know, continued 
continued on. Uh, while I was there, I worked, um, that's when I worked on Sony PlayStation. So I spent many hours playing video games, but I also worked on Bush Entertainment. So SeaWorld and Bush Gardens. Uh, and over the course of a few years, Anheuser-Busch, who owned those at the time, brought, decided to bring PR in-house. And so I moved in-house to AB. Uh, and I spent about a decade there. And while I started in a more communications role, it evolved over time into a, a, more of a marketing position, um, just sort of following things I was passionate about, curious about, um, you know, or, or was doing well at. And then from there, I joined Enterprise. And when I joined Enterprise, it was just Enterprise Rent-A-Car. But while there, we acquired Alamo and National and became Enterprise Holdings. And I ran the media sponsorship and creative departments. And I think the great thing about that was really all of those past experiences sort of coming together. Um, and I spent about seven or eight years at Enterprise and then you know, I guess I'm making a tour of all the big St. Louis brands, ended up at Claris, um, you know, have a huge love of fashion, um, love footwear. So while beer and cars were fun, I'm really doing something I'm much more passionate about here. So that's sort of the journey. And I think the thread that keeps all of this together, I love to tell stories. Uh, that's how I got into journalism. Uh, and I have really been able to bring that to life across all of my jobs um, and all of my positions. And then I've also really been passionate about understanding people and consumers. Um, and so, you know, really understanding the consumer and figuring out what they need, you know, as before they need it and then being able to market to it is key for, you know, the roles I've been in. So that's kind of the foundation of where it all probably began and started and has continued through. So Calaris, for those of you who don't know, was the former Brown Shoe. We're located right here in um, downtown Clayton. And about eight years ago, the company itself went through a rebranding. So we wanted to change our name from Brown Shoe into something else. Um, the word Calaris comes from the Latin word Calare, meaning to glow with passion or intensity. And we really thought that was the right um, you know, decision. Our 140 year legacy of craftsmanship certainly provided a great foundation. Um, but, you know, we really needed to focus on the next chapters, which are being written through technology. Of course, the fabulous people that work here, um, you know, research, manufacturing, sustainability, sourcing. And we felt like Brown Shoe was sort of more holding us with a, sort of an eye to the to our history. And also Claris is, you know, branching off. It isn't just about shoe. It's about fashion. There's apparel, there's success. So it made sense to kind of have a more holistic, broader name. So uh, Daniel hit on this, but this is our family of brands. Um, so, you know, you know, and across the board, our collective purpose with all of these brands is really to inspire people to feel great feet first. We are truly experts in foot care um, and foot making and uh, shoe making, shoe craftsmanship. And so, you know, that's the common thread between all of these brands. And we've got different offerings. And of course, um, they're all aimed squarely at different consumers as well. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. All right. What makes us Calaris? I talked about our passion and our purpose. You know, we, we plant on our values of passion, accountability, curiosity, creativity, and caring. We, that's what we really look at when we're thinking about hiring and if people will be a good cultural fit and help us sort of bring the brands to the next level. Um, you know, our advantage, in addition to having 140 years of experience in making great footwear, um, you know, we really have brands that span diverse consumer segments, and then we are powered by industry leading product creation, global sourcing and fulfillment. And fulfillment became a huge deal this year with the pandemic um, as stores closed and everything was being shipped you know, to consumers in individually. Uh, so not all brands were able to rise to that um, occasion like Claris was with sort of these state of the art fulfillment centers. But above all, in everything that we're doing, consumer insights and feedback really drives all of our decisions, our design process, our marketing strategies, you know, and really every single choice we make. It all comes back to who is the consumer um, and really understanding them and being empathetic to who they are and how they're living their lives. And that's not new for us. We've really been driven by consumer insights from the very beginning. And I'm not going to hit on all these, but two I find super interesting. In the 1860s, um, 
a insight bubbled up that our left and right feet are in fact different. And so shoes started being designed for a left and right foot. Before that, the shoes were just made on a single last. So we've all put a shoe on the wrong foot. And that doesn't feel great. So it's just interesting that that really didn't come to be a thing until the 1860s. And then shortly after that, with our naturalizer brand, this idea that a woman's foot is shaped really differently than a man's foot. And they started creating lasts designed to fit a woman and um, you know her needs. And so that, and our naturalizer brand, you know, we fondly, you know, it's tagline is the brand with the beautiful fit. And it really all dates back to that one insight that like a woman's foot's different. And so it's not just about shrinking what we're making for men. It's a, it's, it's a different mold and a different laugh. All right. So with that said, the other big thing at play is, you know, consumers' expectations and behaviors have changed dramatically. And we all know that, we've all lived it, and it was even accelerated you know, tenfold in this past year with the pandemic. But we have so much choice. Um, we expect to things to get things like immediately and easily. You know, you hit order on Amazon and you like are like, why isn't this already in my hand? Like I I hit order. Like we just expect things so seamlessly and quick. Um, mobile technology and social media have exploded. Um, there's a blurring for us, which is really important. This idea of the blurring of, of athletic and fashion. Our dress brands really suffered this past year, and our casual brands, you know, skyrocketed. So, you know, that was interesting. Sustainability and social responsibility. You know, we know our Gen Z consumer and Gen and millennial, but even more so, you know, Gen N, this is so important to them. They want to engage with brands that are passionate and care about the things they're passionate and care about. So we all need to be doing better. At Calaris, we've made great headway here. It's about progress, not perfection. We certainly aren't perfect and there's plenty more to be doing in fashion in general gets a lot of bad marks on this. Um, so, you know, that's work to be done and we continue to, to fight that fight. Um, and then at the end of the day, brands matter. Um, this idea that while you have a proliferation of choice, consumers are opting into brands they know and trust and can count on. And, you know, they might count on them for comfort in terms of footwear, or they might count on them because they know if with every original collection shoe they buy, that company is planting a tree. So there are many reasons to care, and we need to figure out what are those reasons that are going to resonate the most with our target audience and really bring those to life. You know, at the end of the day, you know, Jack Taylor at Enterprise used to always say our brands are the most valuable thing we own. I totally agree. And we, you know, we do business every day as if our success depends upon our company's good name, because it does. Um, so our reputation and powerful brands, you know, that we're building together here are our most precious assets. All right. So why do we even market to consumers? And I think, you know, before we jump right into sharing some of the great work that we've done and we can talk about beautiful imagery and photography and we can talk about style and design and we can talk about the right message and always, of course, with the consumer at the center of this, um, you know, as you all embark into real, you know, to careers once you graduate, you'll find that you have to fight for budget dollars. And so I literally every, you know, make a case every day, you know, that talks about the importance of marketing um, to consumers. If we build it, they don't just automatically come, right? So why do we market to consumers? Well, the United States has the largest footwear market in the world. So there's one, one reason why. Um, in the U.S. alone, I gotta hide my little, thing. I'm sorry. In the U.S. alone, there are 328 million adults who are 18 plus of shoe buying age. Consumers in the United States spent $79 billion buying 2.5 billion pairs of shoes um, in 2019. So that's approximately 7.4 pairs of shoes a year per person. Um, you know, and it translates into about $277. And guess what? They're choosing the footwear and the brands that they want to buy from, and we want them to choose ours. So we've got a market. 
there are more than 500 uh, footwear brands. So here's just a couple of logos I threw up on screen, you know, but there's big, you know, been around forever, huge budgets, high Nike, you know, New Balance, things like that. There's small, there's emerging, you know, where did Rothy's and, and you know, Allbirds come from? They kind of came from nowhere. Um, over $517 million is spent annually by footwear man manufacturers on advertising that's targeting, you know, the American consumer, and not all budgets are created equal. Um, so that's why it's so important to really understand that consumer, understand what matters to them, uh, and be able to market in a meaningful way. Okay, everybody tracking? You've, I don't know, you've probably heard that marketing really boils down to like the right message at the right time to the right person. And, you know, there's a lot of truth in that. And I think the other thing is when you talk about message, you know, there's really two key marketing communication strategies that you'll work on in your life. One is about brand development. And this is where like, this is what makes my heart beat. This is what I love to do. This is the work I'm most passionate about. And this is what builds powerful brands. And I've had the opportunity to work on some, you know, very powerful global brands. But brand development is for long-term business needs where consideration is motivated by brand reputation. So that's investing in those sustainable efforts. That's investing in stories that matter. Uh, then there's brand promotion. And 2020 was almost the death of me because the whole year was spent in this bucket. And it was really for short-term business needs where consideration is motivated by incentives. So, oh, I might not have been thinking about you, but you're 50% off. I'm gonna go check this out. Oh, Famous Footwear, which is one of our great brands. You have buy one, get one almost, you know, almost on all year last year. And that was just the reality of every, of, you know, where the consumer was and that we had lots of inventory to get rid of and all the stores were shuttered. So it was a, an online play. But anyway, today I'm going to spend most of my time talking about brand development because I think that's really where the power is and where the partnership between great creative, um, you know, great marketing insights and then execution all come together. So when I think about, uh, you know, the job to be done. And when you're, you know, addressing any different kind of marketing scenario, we really think about the customer's life cycle and this idea that it's never ending. So, you know, you might have also seen this as a funnel. And I think, you know, in, in my early days of marketing, it was all about a funnel. The problem with the funnel is it kind of says like there's an end destination. And once you've got a loyal consumer, you've got them for life. And in today's world, that that isn't true. It's sort of this continual cycle. So discover that's reach, that's awareness, that's telling big brand stories, that's getting great PR placements. Explore, that's about acquisition. How do I get people sort of, how do I get my brands into the consideration set of a, a consumer? Consumers will say they think about three to five brands, shoe brands when they think about a shoe need. So how do you, how do you make sure you're always in the, you know, that top th three? Buy, that's really about conversion. Like how do we bring them in and actually convert them, whether that's in a store or in these days, mostly online. And so, you know, you have email, you have direct mail, home, you know, th those sort of tactics help drive that. Branded search, fitting on keywords that folks are searching on um, and moving them through. You keep kind of moving through. So now you've bought them, they've converted. That's great. How do I keep engaging with them? How do I retain them? I certainly don't want to be a one and done. And when you're operating in that promotional bucket, you often are. You're bringing in somebody that was just attracted by a price point. Doesn't mean that they now like are an advocate of the brand. But if you have them and you've, you've learned something about them, you've collected their email, they followed you on social, you have the opportunity to engage and try to you know retain. A lot of what we do in this front are retargeting ads, which I know you all you know are probably victims of every day you go and visit a website and then that little shoe or dress or whatever is going to follow you around you know everywhere else you are so you're reading an article on USA Today and it's over here reminding that you checked it out um, so we do a lot of that that's sort of a real world example and then ultimately is that advocacy or loyalty like you want the consumer to know the brand care about the brand 
and love the brand so much that they talk it up to their friends. And we have loyalty programs for that. And um, that's a great way to nurture it. We also think our, our organic social following um, is a big part of that. We did a lot more um, Insta lives and events where consumers could like really engage with the brand in the past year uh, out of necessity and going forward because it's it's proven to really work and helps us nurture that relationship with the, that consumer that really loves you. Okay, so a couple other just like fun facts that we probably all know, but I think it's useful, you know, useful to plant on. Um, you know, good marketing really is meets the consumer where they are. And for most of 2020, we were all at home, or more precisely, you know, in front of our screens um, or our devices. So that's really where we spent from a brand, a media perspective, all of our time this past year as well. And due to that, you know, we weren't the only ones like 2020 was definitely a year of budget cuts for corporate America and big brands, but, but it was not a, a cut across digital media. We actually saw that amped up um, as more brands and companies thought that was like a place that would work and drive some commerce for them. So media actually went up, but global media consumption, the cost of media, global media consumption has hit an all time high. Um, Twitter saw, you know, their average daily users jump 23% this past year. There was an increase in Pinterest of 60%, which makes great sense because people were going there to get inspired. So many people were doing things to improve their, their living um, space, whether they needed to make a home office or a school for children or whatever else. So Pinterest, great increases. And we're big advertisers on Pinterest. So, you know, that's just something that like, it was great. There was more traffic. It was bad you know, the pricing was going up and up and up. There was a 10 to 20% increase uh, in broadcast shows and cable news ratings doubled last year. It makes sense. We were all tuning in to try to understand this pandemic and what was happening next. And if anyone had any good news to share. Uh, more social media connections with heightened engagement. That also makes great sense. You were unable to see anyone in real life. So, you know, even people like, you know, were like joining Facebook that maybe never would have um, as a way to see friends and family. Streaming, which has been on fire, continued expansion, and that was heightened by a lot of them thinking about the consumer, thinking about building loyalty and offering up free subscriptions for, you know, the year or six months, you know, as a way to get through this pandemic, but then also getting a whole lot of people subscribed and in the mix. Consumers are exposed to about 10,000 brand messages a day. And at any given time, 84% of us are shopping for something. And 97% of us go online to find that product or read a review or do some price checking. Um, so really in 2020 um, and even before, but there's virtually no barriers to entry. Um, so, you know, these major digital acquisition channels, you know, have made it so easy for even novice marketers to get in there including if you know like sometimes you get random ads from brands and you get you know you think that picture looks great and you're sure that swimsuit's going to look fabulous on you and then when you get it it's from an unknown brand it took 21 days to get there it's actually coming from you know somewhere abroad and it's like horrible it doesn't fit you can't return it so that goes back to that brands matter kind of thing but it was really easy for novice marketers to quickly and easily spin up creative and push out ads um and so as they saw success on Google and Facebook and Instagram and Twitter and Pinterest, you know, more brands just kept going into the space. And so that gets that idea of 10,000 brand exposures a day. And what's the danger in that? Well, consumers become totally desensitized. It's like there's so much coming at us and there's so many brands and so many options. Like I don't, I don't, I don't notice. I don't, I just don't even care. Um, so that's why, that's where the magic of the marketing, the creative, the message, um, you know, really has to serve as a disruptor and give people a reason to care about the brand and, and take a moment to engage. Um, and, you know, I've, I've hit on this a lot, but, you know, we've said the pandemic, really, we saw a five-year acceleration in consumers' online shopping habits in the past year. So while we all knew we were going, we got there a whole lot faster due to COVID. Um, and 42% of total footwear market sales are expected to be through e-commerce in 2021. And that's huge. When I joined Calaris um, seven years ago, 10%. So like it's just skyrocketing. And that's not just our owned websites, although that's a big part of it. It's also the business that we do on Amazon. It's the business we do with Nordstrom.com, Macy's.com. You know, so every, all, all of us are seeing this across the board. And for our business in particular, um, 
you look at that 32.3 was our e-commerce penetration and 2021 it's 47. Um, and the difference in the number I just said was I was talking about only our owned e-commerce, which was really small when I got here, but it's become bigger and bigger. So how do we fight all of this? How do we fight the noise? How do we fight the decent, you know, getting consumers being decentivized? Um, so here we talk a lot about brand power and does this brand have power or not? And if it doesn't, what do we need to be doing to try to strengthen that? So our objective is to move consumers to a different state of emotional connection while capturing outsized market share um, and, you know, obviously impressive profit margins. So we're not always having to play that, that on sale game. And how do we achieve this? You know, we think first and foremost, we have to identify and understand our consumer target. And we have to really, really understand the consumer. And then our brands have to have a clear purpose and intent. Like we cannot have all the brands trying to be all the things to all the people. And we need to fight that urge. And you know, say these brand, this brand is meant to do this against this target audience. And then we really need authentic and meaningful storytelling. From a product perspective, we need big halo, you know, products, um, sort of hero items. And then, you know, so in some instances, we do these like halo segments, and we can talk a little bit about that, like a more aspirational version of the brand that might help us capture a different consumer or move into a different retailer. So activating brand power. For us, it's really about image and identity. And this is where Daniel and I have done some great work together in his time at Calaris. But there's that differentiation by brand based on consumer, reason for being, and then consistent imagery and tone um, based on the emotional core. So that is where the, you know, the marketing and creative teams really spend their time at Calaris and their focus. So now I was just going to share sort of a couple of like light case studies um, that bring some of this to life and we can, I'll, I can, you know, move through these quickly, but all the things I just touched on, I'm hoping you kind of see it all come together here. So it's less esoteric and more like real world and how it all happens. But before I do that, I don't know, Emily, were there any questions that would like relate more to the first part of the deck that would make sense for us to talk about now? Um, yeah, we got, uh, we got a few questions just based upon, you know, some snippets of things that you said. Uh, we have a question from Elena McAllister who said, if you have time, could you talk a bit more about how storytelling has been a constant throughout your job slash work? It's a super interesting, or it's super interesting to see it as a mindset or approach. Um, so yeah. I think- And I think with some of these case studies that will come out um, and, you know, we can talk more about that, but, I'm a journalist by like, that's, I think that should have been my, I should have probably stayed that course. Maybe. I don't know. I love to ask questions. I love to get at the root of things. I like, I just can't learn enough about situations or people. Um, and then I want to like, then I want to tell a story. And uh, so the beauty for me is that I, you know, was able to do that, you know, in across the board, I feel like I'm doing so much more of it these days because we have to produce so much content. Um, that, that this, this churn and desire for all this content and all these channels where we push out content is also very different than, you know, what I would have been doing 15 years ago when we were working on broadcast ads, you know, for Bud Light. Mm -hmm. you, you worked, you, you know, you had a campaign, you were telling short stories, it was all for broadcast and it didn't then roll out on other touch points. So you weren't thinking about, okay, and then how will we tell this online or how will we tell this in social or how will we, you know, you had sort of that earned media attitude. You definitely wanted coverage of these things, um, but you just, it, it was, it's just getting more and more like complicated in terms of the different channels you could tell stories in, which makes the stories more layered and deep and nuanced. Um, so I think that's exciting. Okay, naturalizer, let's do this first. Um, this is another one of my favorite charts and I'm not gonna go over this in great detail because I could spend an hour on it. But when I attack sort of work on any brand, I love to bring this to life. You know, at the center of it, you need your brand core. Like how do you distill this brand into a single minded takeaway? Like we need to simplify. Sometimes complication is so much easier than being simple and concise. 
And then you move out from there. And so from there, if you go upwards, we talk about heads and hearts. And so this is like, what's our vision? What are our values? What, what do we believe? Um, proof and pudding, I always think that's like the sort of the reasons to believe. Okay, great, you've inspired me. You've made me think, you've, you've captured my attention, but like, what's the proof? Like, what really are you doing? You care about women's causes? That sounds great, show me. Um, then the walking and talking, and again, this is a lot of where the creative and marketing partner, it's how do we look? You know, what's that beautiful imagery and how are we consistent? It's how do we talk? You know, how do we talk to our consumer in a way that resonates with her? And then how do we behave? And, you know, here it's like, what do we support? Who else do we sponsor? Like putting our money where our mouth is basically. Um, and so I'm not gonna go through this for Naturalizer, but at the essence, because this will help for the rest of the presentation, the core for Naturalizer is a passion to bring women a better shoe today and every day since 1927. And if you remember, one of those insights, like women and men's feet aren't the same. And so this brand was like, women deserve better. They deserve not just a shrunken down man's shoe. Um, we're going to do this. And so that really guides us in all that we do. Um, you know, our tagline, the shoe with the beautiful foot, you know, we talk about how we look, you know, we want to be smart, uncomplicated style. It, this brand is definitely sophisticated, but it's approachable and it's more straightforward. It's not fussy. It's not complicated or tricky fashion. Um, how we talk, you know, we give it to her straight. We want to be real and relatable. We want a genuine conversation with our consumers. You know, we say it's sort of this mixture of grit and grace. And at the end of the day, optimism, you know, is at our emotional core. So we're not angry, you know, we're not, you know, we're not being militant at all, but we, you know, we certainly um, want to help move women and women's causes forward. How we behave, we've been for women since day one. Um, and we've really brought that to life and I'm gonna show some real world examples, but you know, it's really rooted in empowerment, activate, activism, inspiration, um, inclusivity is a huge brand pillar for our Naturalizer brand. And our campaign right now is called Today We Will. And so it really all comes together under that umbrella. I talked a lot about you better know your consumer or, or you're gonna fall flat on your face because you could have the most beautiful images and you could have great product and you could have wonderful messaging, but if it doesn't resonate with her, um, then it's not gonna work out and that campaign is not going to have a long shelf life. So we, we um, fondly call our naturalizer consumer the confident explorer. And I guess it should be really clear. This is like our bullseye. We, we, are, we cast a very wide tent at naturalizer. We are multi-generational for sure. And we have some really fashion forward items. And then we have some really understandable, relatable, you know, kind of boring items and we know that but when we when we're trying to distill what is most important to us we we focus on this this target um and we focus on it because we love we loved her we already had a huge um we already over indexed against this target and she has huge shoe buying potential so she's spending you know, an outsized spend on shoes. So it makes sense. Anyway, younger skewing, uh, millennial and Gen X segments are our fastest growing segments, but we certainly have, you know, plenty of boomers in the mix, I'm sure as well. And, um, you know, we constantly are trying to also bring in that next generation. So that Gen N, ethnically diverse, a real um, proof point for us and pr a proud um, fact for us is that we over index against African American Asians and Hispanic consumers compared to the total pop. Um, so we obviously lean heavy into that as well. Highly educated over indexed for grad school compared to total pop. And this idea of self-directed, like fat, she, you know, she chooses her, what makes sense to her from a fashion perspective. Um, she definitely does that mix a high and low. She might have a $500 bag, but she's wearing $15 jeans from Old Navy. Like she's got a style, it works for her. And, you know, she, she feels good about that. So our organizing idea for, um, naturalizer as this today we will. And that's really our evergreen platform. It's our heart. It's the defining character. And then we are able to execute it um, under different stories and for different channels. So it really is campaignable and it works across the board for all of the different consumer touch points that are important to, you know, this brand. 
So I'm just going to click through uh, some of this, but the real goal here was to feature women who were doing amazing things. Some of them are activists, some of them are entrepreneurs, some of them, you know, have big, um, you know, they're more like on the philanthropist side of things. Uh, but the idea here is that at Naturalizer, we give them a platform to make their voices even more heard. And we lift that up and we inspire that. We have body positivity women. So like um, we have sustainability advocates. So this camp, this campaign started three years ago and we have just been so wowed and amazed by the women that have come into the fold. And the first season, it was harder because you had no sort of proof. Once we did this once, and then we could show these other women. Now women are calling us and asking to be featured in this campaign. So it's been, um, you know, a real, it's come a long way since it's launched and something we're proud of. Um, so that'll give you sort of a quick look at some of the women I talked about. Um, you know, like I said, we've got two, the founders of CurvyCon, which took the camp, took the idea of New York Fashion Week and like, you know, sort of pushed it on its head and invented one for um, sort of women of real sizes. Um, so the, you know, so that body positivity message. We have Lynn Slater, who's the accidental fashion icon, which happened to her at the age of 60. So where most of the fashion industry might have written her off, like she's come back in a huge way. Um, we've got the science girl. We love her. She's got a PBS uh, a partnership as well, really big on YouTube, um, and this idea of making sure women are coming into STEM in bigger and larger amounts. So just really across the board, you know, uh, a lot of really interesting, phenomenal women. Um, and so they really pay off the brand promise, like this idea of today we will, and then each of them bring their own narrative to that. So um, this is one of the co-founders of CurvyCon. You know, she says, we will live unapologetically, but we will not allow size to dictate our, you know, our life or our style. And at Naturalizer, one of the few brands that has just the such a range of size and fit that this is a really important message for us and we you know already have a huge consumer segment so we've got you know from five to twelves we have narrow calf wide calf so really again being able to service all these kinds of um, consumers so this just gives you a look at some of like the the look and the aesthetic of the campaign and how we brought it to life across our own channels and also paid media um, flip through these kind of quick. Now I'm going to talk more about Rebecca. Um, we partnered with her in a big way in 2019 around uh, voting. And so I want to show you how that played out. She's an activist. She founded the outrage in DC. It happened after the last election where she really felt like women's voices were not being heard. And we certainly weren't being represented at the levels we should be, um, you know, across the board, uh, politically, at local, you know, national levels. Um, so, you know, she, and while it started there, then she has really shown a light on all kinds of injustices from, you know, Black Lives Matter, um, you know, she's working on some things about stop Asian hate. So she's always sort of at that forefront of, you know, where she believes, you know, there's been an injustice and we need to come together to fix it. She's a great organizer. She's also a mother and a businesswoman, obviously. Okay. So this is something I'm super proud of. Um, we worked on this with her. So this is a boot. This this is one of those magical moments that came together. It had great, it had great buzz. It had great PR potential. Um, it made the it made the employees here feel really proud and rally around something, which is important. It also had great commercial success. So when all those things come together, um, you sort of checked all the boxes. So this is a boot that uh, Naturalizer had. It's the Cali boot. It's one of our best selling boots. It's awesome, really comfortable. It's a great boot to march in. We partnered with Rebecca and said, what if we, you helped us create some, um, you know, artwork uh, that, you know, brings forward this idea that women need to vote. We're not telling you for whom you should vote. We're just saying our voices need to be heard and you need to come out in larger numbers. And then all the proceeds from the sale of this limited, so we did that sort of scarcity buzz helped a lot on this, right? This idea of this limited, get it now. Um, all the proceeds will go to benefit She Should Run, which is a great non-for-profit organization in Atlanta that is all about get, inspiring women to run um, for office. And uh, so 
Rebecca loved it. We were off to the races. We had all kinds of really great things planned. And then, you know, a pandemic hit. So we had to rethink everything we thought we were going to do uh, and come up with another plan. But really for us, this was all about activating brand power. And it really gave Naturalizer, like, a sh like we talk about having share of voice in the media spend and share of wallet in terms of like, what's this consumer spending and what are they spending with us? And here we had share of culture. Like we actually were present in a big cultural moment and relevant. And as we work to, you know, always attract a younger consumer, you know, this type of thing um, is really important. So at the end of the day, you know, what were we trying to do, you know, with this um, activation, you know, we wanted to reach a younger consumer. We uh, wanted to underscore our brand's promise of supporting women's causes. Um, and we wanted to keep the brand relevant. We wanted to be part of a conversation. Uh, you know, you don't want to be, you know, forgotten. So we wanted to drive media. We wanted to drive influencer interest, um, consumer awareness. Obviously, we always want to drive sales. We really wanted to drive sales of the Cali boot because it was going to benefit a great cause. Um, and the good news is the Cali boot exists beyond just the boat. You know, we have it just a plain black leather. We had all kinds of fun mixed materials and prints. Um, and we saw a huge lift in the sales of this shoe in general. So we sold out of the boat boot. That's, you know, I'm stealing my own thunder almost immediately. But then we also just saw the sale of the Cali booth, boot skyrocket. So, you know, that was really great. Did it work? Um, so instead of having a really fun live event in DC and inviting media and influencers to it and making it, you know, really like an activation moment, um, we couldn't do that because of the pandemic. So we had a big virtual event instead, you know, and we featured um, women from She Should Run. We featured Rebecca. Um, we featured uh, Stacy, uh, uh, somebody who was out of Stacy Abrams camp in Atlanta. So we had a, a group of really dynamic women and it was great. And, you know, who knows how to measure a virtual event. This is pretty new to us, but 90% of the RSVP, those who RSVP attended, 77% um, actively participated, you know, 85 stayed on for the whole time. And while we scheduled an hour, these women were enjoying the conversation so much and getting such great um, questions from the crew. I think this ended up being almost like a two hour event. It was a bit of a marathon. Um, and out of it, then we generated 53 million um, social impressions, which really this kicked it off. This launched the boot, it launched the idea. They didn't talk about the boot, like that wasn't the purpose. It was all about, you know, empowered women, empowering women and how all of them have done this in their career. Sort of the side note at the end was the boot and the fact that the purchases would benefit she should run. Hey, Holly. Also, Oh. Can, you, can you go back one? There, there's a question that that bottom right image speaks to about how you interact with illustrators within the line of work. Oh, um, yes. Good so point. Can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah. So the other sort of magic of this collaboration coming together is um, we did not want to like have these shoes mass produced with, with a stamp, you know, out of a factory in China. We really wanted to bring sort of that artisanal craftsmanship story to life too. Um, so we partnered with this artist who had worked with on a couple of live events where she had painted on shoes for us. Um, and so she literally turned her house like over. She sent us the best pictures. There's just like, you know, it was a thousand boxes of shoes. So it took over like her whole, uh, her whole house and she hand painted vote on every single one of those a thousand pairs um so is there something else you wanted to underscore there daniel the, the question was is there a place for illustration and branding so i think you <laughs> the answer is yes yes and you know what i think is hard i think there's tons of place it's a need that always pops up and daniel you could talk about that while you were here and that's where networking is so important because often maybe that skill set isn't something that is within like as part of the, the corporate team although i would love it and i think it would only add to it um but it's just that idea of networking and having your name out there because these things pop up all the time and you want to say like who can go help us with this um you know and like by sheer chance, I had like connected with Kirsten on Instagram about something. And then I invited her to an event in Chicago because she's from Chicago. And now it's turned into a, you know, a much more um, sort of long-term ongoing relationship with the brand. So um, definitely. We had great um, pickup across earned media, which again, there's that third party credibility, which really underscores. So this all came together um, and, you know, in such a, a great way. Uh, so I'm just going to click through this quickly, just 
impactful coverage. We could have never paid for this kind of coverage, right? Like we could have never had ads in Shape USA Today, ABC News, Life and Style. We could have never done that. Um, but the fact that, you know, we, we had a great pitch and a really great authentic story, um, you know, people loved it and couldn't get enough of it. I don't know if we have time for this video. I'm going to skip through it. But Extra just did a really fun piece on the vote boots that brought it to life. So across, you know, all, oh, nope, I'm not going to skip it. I'm going to play it. And when you get out there to rock the boat, you want to look your best, of course. Well, there's a lot more to voting chic than just red, white, and blue. From Terry Washington's serious swag to Selena Gomez's dance for action on TikTok, the stars are making rock the boat statements with their fashion statements. You can promote the boat this year by wearing tees, jackets, masks. If you were looking for a get off the boat look, this has to be it. It's a crisp, clean blazer with voter patches, stressed denim, paired with a subtle button down and comfy flats. I'm obsessed with Bernie shoes. They launched their vote collection to really inspire women to get out and vote. All of this is from American Eagle. We have a denim jacket paired with this really cute, customizable tee. American Eagle sister brand Barry also has some really cute options. And Toki by Gravitas has some really cute boat masks. These socks will do a lot. From Mother Denim, $5 from every pair sold will be donated to I Am A Voter. So Lebs are a huge fan of these naturalizer boots. A portion of these proceeds from these special boots go to She Should Run. It's a nonpartisan organization that helps get women running for office. Okay, so just like, you know, all of it coming together in a really uh, impactful way. And, uh, you know, the other thing is without a big marketing budget to like do a lot of paid media, we really sort of had to like get creative with obviously PR pitching, but then also gifting. Um, but when you have a really great story like this, you don't have to work so hard. And so we had just a lot of great um, sort of VIP celebrity interest along the way as well. Um, and so at the end of the day, you know, I think the big news is, uh, you know, we had great attendance in the event, the media impressions we delivered across uh, premier media publications, broadcast digital, the celebrity impressions, the social media impressions, you know, really, you know, just amplified the story in a way that I don't know that any of us imagined. We sold out of the vote boots almost immediately, but the great news was then consumers just started buying the Cali boot as well. So um, it was a really fun initiative and was like a real bright spot in a otherwise not as, you know, not as amazing of a year. Um, okay, so now I wanted to switch to Franco Sardo and really talk more about sort of design and art and craftsmanship. And Daniel, I'd love for you to weigh in throughout here too. But there was a real need, um, you know, there was an insight here that we had this brand that we would debate whether it was a brand or a label. We definitely made shoes that consumers loved via Franco. But I wasn't sure you know, none of us really knew, did they understand the brand? When they closed their eye and they thought of Franco Sardo, there was kind of a void. It was just like the shoe that they bought at Dillard's. So there was a real opportunity for us to, um, you know, think about this brand in a different way and to stand for something. And so where we sort of ended up and is really leaning into our Italian heritage and this idea of the art of everything. You know, we wanted to invite visual attention. We wanted to sort of act like an independent and indie, like a new brand, like we didn't have like all this like, you know, corporate sort of noise around us. Um, and, you know, we needed to create a product nucleus as well. And we just wanted to stand, you know, to stand for sort of timeless um, art as part of like the everyday. So this, you know, this is really a beautiful campaign. It, you know, this idea of the art of everything. We've shot the shoes like their artwork. Um, and we've really like heroed uh, the shoe imagery and the shoe itself. It's a piece of art. We talk a lot about the Italian designer and its craftsmanship, you know, from his own hands. So we show a lot of shoemaking that concentrates, you know, on, on like on his hands um, making this. So this idea that Franco Sardo embodies timeless wearable style inspired, inspired by the craft and design of Italian footwear, rooted in classics with modern detail and superb fit, Franco Sardo prevails in giving women on the go a modern array of footwear that radiates style and confidence. And the interesting thing about this work, we did this all um, during the pandemic, so we were we had a lot of big plans for how we were going to shoot this to almost feel museum-esque and where we were going to shoot. And that all changed and we had to do this sort of socially distanced. So um, 
you know, not only could we not travel, but we had to have really tiny crews. So usually on a photo shoot, you're going to have, I mean, the number of people is always sort of mind boggling. Uh, everyone has a really specific job. And now you'll have to do that, you know, with like two or three people. Um, and so anyway, it was really a different kind of shoot. Um, but we thought that it really brought to life this story of a different kind of classic. And so just beautiful work here. I'm the models beautiful. The wardrobing is great. Art, like art direction and design were so important here um, because really the visuals and the way we're treating the product and the typography and all of those things are like really the heroes here um, across the board. And you could check out the Franco Sardo website too because this is all fall and now we have um, the spring assets which have been done in a really similar way and we're bringing you know, even more of that, um, you know, that, that art story to life. T ten till. Okay, so I think that's good. And, and we can just move to questions. Um, I, I wanted to hit on both of those, uh, those two brands, but what do you guys want to talk about? Well, the, at the follow-ups, the, the key points, I think you can go through those and then questions. Okay. You could jump All in. All right, let's do that. But okay, these, so these takeaways. Yeah. here are the takeaways and I can share, I know this is recorded and Emily, if you need any of these slides, you know, I'm happy to share, but I think the big takeaways is how quickly the marketing landscape changes, but how the principles of marketing remain the same. Um, so the way we reach consumers is constantly evolving. Like when I first started, there were three TV stations to buy media on and then, then you were done. NBC, CBS, ABC, like check. So like that's evolved so much. Um, so we're always evolving how we're going to reach the consumer, but our approach to how we think about a brand, how we build a brand, how we invest in brand power, that really hasn't changed. And so I think that's really important. Um, so always consumer first, and then where she is in the life cycle is important. And um, then this idea of omni-channel all the times for brands and agencies, it's vital that we look holistically across marketing efforts. I think that's where we see a lot of things fail. You have a really great idea and it's executed beautifully, maybe in store, and then you just it falls apart everywhere else. Or conversely, you've done it really well on your own website, but that's not being pulled through um, socially. And you have to nuance these things because the different channels, obviously, um, you want to privilege maybe something a little bit different, but it's that idea of how do you align and create messaging and channels through that entire consumer journey so that they know your brand, they understand your brand. Consumers will not work hard to understand us, so we, we need to remember that. We can't get overly complicated. Content is still king. So, you know, whether it's powerful imagery, whether it's the best headline we've ever read, um, you know, if you don't have strong content, we are not going to get their attention. You know, we want to make bold statements with unique campaigns to differentiate ourselves from our competitors. I love to say this to my teams because we have. I say we're a fertile group. There are so many great ideas. We can go all over the place. We can ideate for hours upon hours, but vision without execution is hallucination. So at some point the ideation, you know, needs to be toned down and we need to start thinking about like, what can we execute? What can we do? How can we move the needle? How can I sell shoes? Um, you know, that, that that's key. So we, I wanna, you know, we need to remember that. All right, so there you go. I know that was a lot guys. Thanks for uh, powering through with me. Awesome. Thank you so much, Holly. Uh, I definitely, uh, I may want to borrow some of those specific chart infographics just to share with uh, everybody sort of asynchronously, because I think that really concisely uh, kind of wraps up a lot of the stuff that you talked about. Um, so I will reach out to you for those. Um, so we did get a couple of questions and, and we got one specifically that I think uh, you kind of touched on with the uh, the vote boot and sort of the idea of activism in tandem or, or working within marketing and, and brand solutions. Um, but we this is sort of the opposite of that in the question, which is working in marketing. Do you ever have to do you ever have to push for a product or idea you don't personally believe in? If so, how do you reconcile any negative feelings around that? Oh. Good question. I don't know that I've ever had to work on something I just at the core, like, don't believe in. I definitely have my favorites and my not as big of favorites. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, two things. One, if you can spin a great story and you're a good marketer, you can probably bring the room along with you to go down a path that you feel better and stronger about. Um, you, you, 
and you know, I guess sometimes like the almighty dollar is going to win out. And so that's when sometimes you maybe say like, I can't believe that we have to, um, I can't believe that I have to go and present to Walmart one more time. Like, can we just get out of that retailer? You know, but like, I can, you know, I can understand from a business perspective, maybe why that, you know, we have to be in there. The distribution is big and it's this specific shoe. Um, so, you know, I don't know that I, but I, I think it would be hard if you had to work on something that just, you were like totally against. I'm lucky I haven't. And, you know, at Calaris, it's such a creative group um, and it's so diverse that I feel like, you know, you're, most of the things that we're going to stand up for and want to do are going to be important to me personally. Yeah. I think Holly, that also speaks to being deliberate of, about where you've worked. Like you're not working at four companies or, or, you know, products you don't believe in. So well, that, that's very true. Yeah. If, if, if you're you, working on a cigarette brand or you were working on a tobacco brand or something that just fundamentally didn't align. Yeah, you're totally right. And I think the, the, where that could come into play, I guess, is at an agency where you have all kinds of clients, you know, but then hopefully you would have good enough leadership that you could say like, hey, I'm way better suited for this one than that one. Well, but then it's the Don Draper thing. It's if you don't like what they're saying, change the conversation. There you go. They're good enough at marketing, you can take them along with you. Um, so true. So that's excellent. Um, so there was actually sort of a follow-up comment from Tyler Stallings. Hi, Holly, long time. You worked with my husband, Dave Wolf at AB. Uh, oh, yeah. Sorry, I'm unable to turn my camera on at the moment. Adding uh, to the question above, can you share a few specific examples of design for good, which I think the vote boot definitely qualifies as, um, and sustainable and responsible practices. Students today are very interested in working in a responsible way, balancing consumerism with activism. And I think a lot of that sort of aligns itself with um, uh, sustainability in the fashion industry, which I'm sure you you come up. Yeah. You know, so uh, yeah, agreed. We have this conversation constantly. We had, you know, we were having it in important way in meaningful ways, but then I don't know, there was a tipping point probably five years ago where we had an influx of new um, talent on our pr product teams to develop shoes who really brought all kinds of new energy and almost demands like we are like this is just silly like we can make this choice or this choice and it makes this kind of difference and they all uh, had joined our Dr. Scholl's team and that was the first team I worked on here too so like a little group of us quietly got together and just started doing things before we got noticed um, because we knew as soon as it got noticed it would get corporatized and then it would get slowed down um, so Scholl's is the furthest along and I they've got you know great goals like by 2022 they want all of their shoes to have like 100% of the recyclable materials that we're able to have in shoes. There are some parts and pieces that can't be, but like this is like algae foam on the, in the insoles, um, bamboo, uh, recycled plastic bottles, which I know everyone's seen a lot of. A lot of shoe companies are doing that, but I think the bamboo and the algae are interesting and unique to us right now. Um, working with like sourcing all of our leathers through the leather working group which is a a national or a globally known company that really makes sure that the leathers that you're getting are made in the most sustainable non-wasteful way so partnering with big organizations that know more than us um, and that's why it's good that it's being corporatized because then now we have scale and we can do this across the board and the other big thing we did almost immediately on Shoals and now we've done across all of them is this single ship box so before you would get if you ordered a box online you would get a box in a box basically um, so there was just so much packaging waste and so like we've reduced all of that and like near and dear to my heart for Dr. Shoals for every original shoe um, that you purchase we partner with um, a company and a tree is planted. So, and we've got great stats and figures on that, like how much, you know, how much plastic we've saved, how many trees we've built, um, how much CO2 we've saved from being re-released. And, and, and so the good news is, is now there's a corporate wide sort of report card. Uh, everyone is growing in the same direction. The brands are at different parts uh, of the lifestyle. And like we say here all the time, it's about progress, not perfection. Like certainly not going to be out there waving a flag saying we're doing all of this right, but we are making conscious decisions at every step in the process um, to, you know, to be more um, eco-conscious and to make these shoes in a better way. That's awesome. Um, I want to open it up just in case anybody is logged on that wants to turn their video on and ask a question. Just remember, you know, Holly's, Holly's open to any questions that you guys might have. 
Yeah, or connect on LinkedIn and we can talk offline. But if you want to be entered in for a shoe, you better uh, you better type a question fast. I do have one other question um, from Alexis Kennedy. Uh, she wants to know uh, what are what are some of the what are some more of the changes that you're seeing in the industry uh, that came along with the pandemic that you think might be permanent changes? Well, I think um, online shopping behavior, just, you know, like any barrier that was there, I think is gone. Consumers got so used to that um, and comfortable with it and it worked for them. And then the maybe those people who didn't want to do it realized there is like some efficiency and ease. And um, so that I also think that, you know, since we've all been locked in, I believe that in 20 two and beyond in a little bit of 21, we're actually gonna see like a resurgence of old school marketing tactics, more like, you know, um, event driven, um, experiential because people are just, you know, like we've, I, I don't know about you, but like, I don't, how many more emails do you wanna read, you know, with a sale or whatnot? Like, I think we've over optimized, you know, over digitized and certainly over saturized that digital space. So I think brands are gonna have to start giving some experiences to make consumers care more and want to come out and like, you know, interact with the brand. And I think there will be a big resurgence of some of those, um, those tactics and ideas. So that's exciting too. I, I have one question before you wrap up. Can, can you speak a little bit to uh, all, all the creative, all the design and how design and marketing kind of works together? Yeah. Um, how big is the team and, and kind of how do you navigate that? Yeah. So um, I would say our team is about uh, maybe 65 people. It's weird because it's been a, a, a tough year. What I love about the way Calaris works is that, and Daniel, you can speak to this, we, we all sit amongst each other and it is definitely a team effort. So it is not like marketing briefs creative and then they go into a room and they quietly work for, you know, three weeks and then they come out with this big like ta-da, like that is not at all what happens. We all partner, we're all in it. Daniel used to sit right behind me. We would talk to each other all day long, like, look at this, what about this? You know, this is what I'm thinking from an activation standpoint. So we need more things developed like this. Um, so super collaborative, uh, you have to have systems in place. Like, so you have to put in a brief and it has to go through because otherwise deadlines wouldn't be met and everybody would be pulling out their hair. So we certainly have systems and processes, but I also think we have really open dialogue, um, and great exchange of ideas. And like I said, it's such a creative atmosphere that it's, you know, the, the ideas are endless. We try to pair up a marketing person with a creative person across every single thing we're working on so that there's that nice sort of, um, you know, balance of like the art, the science, um, and how it's all coming together. Love it. Is that right, Daniel? Do you have anything yeah. you want to add about how we did that? <laughs> it sounds, you answered it beautifully. Okay. Excellent. And we, we miss Daniel. We keep him come back anytime. <laughs> oh. Thank you, Holly. <laughs> thank you thank you holly that was awesome um so uh i i think that's where we'll end it that seems like a great place to end is that all right i appreciate everyone's time thank you all uh thank you for coming and speaking to us today and uh thank you daniel for suggesting that holly come and speak with us today and thank you for everybody that uh logged on and joined us uh i'm going to go ahead and stop recording now <laughs>